Tonight at 10, all COVID restrictions in England will end in three days' time, despite the concerns of some experts. Changes are part of the Living with COVID plan, with an end to the legal requirement to self-isolate after a positive test. Let us learn to live with this virus and continue protecting ourselves and others without restricting our freedoms. This is a half-baked announcement from a government paralysed by chaos and incompetence. It is not a plan to live well with Covid. We'll be asking if the latest figures justify the change and we'll be looking at the different positions in Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. Also tonight. President Putin moves closer to a military invasion of Ukraine. He tells the Russian people that he's formally recognised two breakaway regions. Latest. Despite weeks of diplomacy and a string of world leaders urging Vladimir Putin to ease tension, the Kremlin has triggered a major escalation of this crisis. The latest on Storm Franklin bringing heavy rain and strong winds to many parts of the UK. And tributes are paid to the music entrepreneur and promoter Jamal Edwards, who's died suddenly at the age of 31. And coming up in the sports on the BBC News Channel, cruise control for Djokovic, victory in his first match back on tour since being deported from Australia. Good evening. All COVID restrictions in England will end in three days' time. The Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, says it's a move away from government measures towards a policy of personal responsibility. But some NHS leaders say it would be very premature to see this as some kind of permanent victory over the virus. The changes are part of the Living with COVID plan, uh, with an end to the legal requirement to self-isolate after a positive test. The universal testing programme will also end from the 1st of April, even for people with symptoms, and free testing will only be available to the most vulnerable. An additional booster dose will be offered to all of those over 75, and then from the spring to the most vulnerable people over 12 years old. In a moment, we'll examine the data behind the decision and the likely economic impact. But first, our political editor, Laura Koonsberg, reports on Mr Johnson's announcement, and there are some flashing images coming up. Now, and then, the empty streets and silence of early lockdown. Today, millions of workers heading back to their desks, replacing the ghosts of empty offices before. The first vaccine, a modern miracle. Jabs in almost every arm now. Good evening. A prime minister back then with an emergency instruction. You must stay at home. Today, the laws which governed our behaviour swept away. We will remove all remaining domestic restrictions in law. From so from this Thursday, if you test positive in England, it won't be law to stay at home. From April, only the most vulnerable will get free COVID tests, but there'll be another booster vaccine for the elderly and those at risk. Mr Speaker, it is time that we got our confidence back. We don't need laws to compel people to be considerate to others. So let us learn to live with this virus. Minister, is it too soon to be relaxing restrictions? But COVID's never been straightforward. Morning. Ministers turned up this morning to finalise the details. Why is the Cabinet meeting cancelled, Minister? But were sent away within minutes. The meeting cancelled because the Treasury and the Department of Health were still haggling over how much to keep spending on COVID tests, ammunition for the opposition. All we've got today is yet more chaos and disarray. Not enough to prepare us for the new variants which may yet develop. An approach which seems to think that living with COVID means simply ignoring it. This morning, he couldn't even persuade his own health secretary to agree the plan. Northern Ireland's already scrapped its legal restrictions, but Scotland and Wales are sticking for now, and there's concern about the Prime Minister's moves. This statement is not about protecting the public. It's about the Prime Minister scrambling to save his own skin. First and foremost, removing the legal rules will make many practical differences. 
but it's also the end of a strange and stressful era, in England at least, when politicians have passed laws that dictated so many aspects of our lives. For Boris Johnson, it is in a way a welcome relief to satisfy those in his party who believe the restrictions have been in place for too long and have been too tight. But the pandemic is not over and loosening up is not without risk. Listen to the Prime Minister's sentiment tonight. I do believe this is a moment of pride for our nation. Then As his top the doctor's caution. Weeks. We still have high rates of Omicron uh, and I would urge people in terms of public health advice, and this is very much the government's position, I'm, that people should still, if they have COVID, uh, try to prevent other people getting it, and that means self-isolating. You are scrapping free tests for all, but you're telling everybody they have to take personal responsibility. How can people take personal responsibility if they may not be able to afford to get a COVID test? Vulnerable uh, people will continue to, to have access to free tests. We were gonna make sure that we invest in, in surveillance, because we want to have uh, the, the, the keenest pair of eyes in the, in the crow's nest to, to watch for the, uh, the iceberg in the form of a new variant. I'm here. The virus is still present, even in Windsor Castle, where the 95-year-old queen herself has COVID with mild symptoms. Another stop on this agonizing national journey, that rarest of moments where every single one of us has been affected. Yet while the laws are loosening, the pandemic has not yet gone and is certainly not forgotten. Laura Kunzberg, BBC News, Westminster. Well, the end to all remaining COVID restrictions in England has prompted a rather mixed reaction from scientists and the public and some concern from those who are clinically vulnerable. But what do the official figures say about the current state of the pandemic in the UK? Do they justify the change at this time? Our health editor, Hugh Pym, reports now from Eastbourne. Taking a new tack and hoping for calmer waters, the government's new approach on COVID has been well signalled and members of Eastbourne and District Model Yacht Club have thought what it means for them. Roger is in his 80s, a potentially vulnerable age, but he's happy for the next step to be taken. We look as though we're on the, sort of the, the sunny side of the mountain now, aren't we? So do you think it's right just to press on without restrictions? Without restrictions, yes. Very definitely. Those here aged 75 and over may be further reassured by news they'll be eligible for a fourth vaccine dose. There's little disagreement over the need to open up at some stage and end legal restrictions, but it's a question of timing. Jonathan is an Eastbourne GP and he's more cautious. This is front end. There are high virus case rates in the area and he's anxious about what the ending of isolation rules might mean for patients. Thank you. If it were to carry on till Easter, maybe that would be a bit better. Yeah, we've been trying very hard to keep people out of the building when they're carrying an infection. They say there's no rules about isolation, they want to come and see us, which is going to make life a little bit more difficult. His concerns are echoed by Linda. There's still a lot of Covid about. I've got three members of my family that have got it. Would you feel more comfortable if it, this compulsory isolation stayed then for the time being? Just to the spring. So what does the science suggest? Covid hospital admissions have been falling and new antiviral drugs have come on stream. There's much higher immunity thanks to previous infections and vaccination. Covid case rates relative to the population have been falling in the UK. They're lower than, for example, Germany and Italy, but above countries like the United States and Canada. Very clear, this pandemic is not over. And While noting Omicron was much less severe than expected, the government's advisers warned future variants could be worse. The one thing that this virus has taught you is not to be cocky. Yeah. So I think we just need to go very carefully. We need to monitor carefully and be prepared to react. PCR testing sites will be wound down in England and free lateral flow tests cut back. That is proving more contentious. Zoe is a secondary school teacher. She thinks the relaxation of isolation rules may be good for her children and other pupils without symptoms, but not necessarily everyone. For the sake of getting people back to work, etc., I think it's very good. But we do have vulnerable members of staff in our school and I just think they may feel very differently about it to how I do. 
Moving on from restrictions at this centre MySkate world and in the wider community, they'll still have to learn to live with COVID. Hugh Pym, BBC News, Eastbourne. Many business leaders, particularly in the hospitality sector, have been calling for a return to normality as soon as possible. But trades unions are warning that removing the legal requirement to self-isolate puts workers in an impossible position. So what effect will today's announcement have on business and on the economy? Our business editor Simon Jack has more details. The darkest days of lockdown seem a distant memory. The economy has bounced back, but changes to the way we live and work are still with us. And for this salon in Manchester suburb Monton, people working from home, spending more time in the neighbourhood, means life is looking good. I'd say that um, business has been better than ever. Um, I think with people working from home, that the schedule's a bit more flexible. We've had a big influx of new clients as well because of that. People spending more time and money here means less of both for city centre businesses like Jen's Distillery and Bar. Her Friday night takings are still 25% lower than pre-pandemic. We, the whole sector, have had a really tough 24 months. It's been, you know, it's been quite bruising. So I'd like to think that, you know, over the coming years, we do start to see offices and businesses getting everyone back into, into their, their workplaces. Is this a game changer? Um, honestly, uh, for us, I don't, I don't think so. I don't see this suddenly bringing an influx of people back to city centres. I do think it will be more organic and it will be more gradual. You can see the political and economic attraction of trying to choose a moment to draw a line under Covid's influence on all our lives, dial down the billion spent on universal free testing, get back to normal. But normal has changed. Those who can work from home want to keep doing it, even demand to keep doing it, and that could have big implications for the people who run our biggest cities. Once Manchester once train and tram use is quote, down a quarter um, compared to pre-pandemic levels, the threatening the viability of some services. The truth is the pandemic is going to leave a mark. It's going to leave a mark on public transport. It isn't going to be able to get straight back to what it was. And that's why the, the government will have to step in and support public transport as cities recover. Or what? Or what will happen? Or we will see the loss of services. And we are already hearing the operators are getting ready to reduce the frequency of services, cut some altogether, 30 services at risk in Greater Manchester. Today's measures were described as a significant step towards normality by the business group, the CBI, but few think it will be business as usual anytime soon, if ever. Simon Jack, BBC News, Manchester. To underline again, the plans announced today are just for England. And with the end of mass testing in England, there's now a question mark about the future of the testing schemes in Scotland and Wales and Northern Ireland. In a moment, we'll hear from our correspondents, uh, Howell Griffith in Wales and Emma Vardy in Northern Ireland. But first, Alexandra McKenzie reports uh, on how Scotland is approaching the next phase of the pandemic. Here in Scotland, the First Minister will outline her plan on living with COVID in the Scottish Parliament tomorrow. She said there'll be some optimism as we move to a new phase in the pandemic. But ahead of that, she said that anyone who tests positive with COVID should self-isolate. She also disagrees with any sudden change to testing arrangements. She would prefer a slower move to a more targeted approach. Here in Scotland, you must wear a face covering in indoor public places. And also vaccine passports are required in places like night clubs and other large gatherings. In Wales, the rules on self-isolation remain. There is a review due next month, but for now, if you test positive for COVID here, you have to self-isolate for at least five days. That may now cause confusion for people who have to cross the border with England for work. Masks remain mandatory in shops and on public transport and in healthcare until the end of this month. But the Welsh Government's biggest concern is that change on testing. They say bringing it to an end is premature and reckless. They had lobbied alongside Scotland and Northern Ireland to keep a testing structure in place until at least the end of June. In Northern Ireland, the remaining COVID restrictions like face masks and vaccine passports were dropped from being legal requirements last week, while self-isolation rules remain. But ending COVID restrictions here wasn't straightforward. Because of the collapse in the power-sharing executive at Stormont, there's no first and deputy first ministers here to sign off on big decisions. 
Instead, Northern Ireland's Health Minister, Robin Swan, had to get the backing of individual ministers instead. And Robin Swan has also signed that letter from the devolved nations setting out their concerns as England plans to end isolation rules. It's calling urgently for more information on the scale of services that will remain to ensure all four nations stay prepared for any potential future waves of the virus. That was uh, Emma Vardy at Storm and Fergus Walsh is with us, our medical editor. First question lots of people are asking today, Fergus. Um, are these changes announced by Boris Johnson justified by the latest figures on the pandemic? Well, Hugh, the number of people in hospital with COVID has been falling for over a month and overall deaths this winter are lower than normal. So there's been no excess from Omicron. At a population level, we've got very strong protection from severe COVID as a result of highly effective vaccines. And millions of us have had our immunity topped up from getting Omicron. Plus, we have these highly effective drugs. We're in a totally different position from where we were a year ago. The dispute, of course, today is about the timing of all of this, especially the removal of free COVID testing even if you have symptoms from all but a small limited groups and social care workers. Now, the government has said it's ready to scale up testing again if a more dangerous variant comes along. But it's clear that the threat from COVID has not gone away completely. We also heard today another important announcement, of course, about the extension of the booster programme. Now, in your view, how significant was that announcement? Well, 7 million over 75s and around half a million people over 12 who are immunosuppressed are going to be offered this spring booster dose. The UK, one of the first countries to offer this. Germany is offering it to the over 70s. Israel already rolling out these second boosters to all adults. It's precautionary and it's meant to tide the most vulnerable over until the autumn when there will be another booster to a much wider group of people. And we may well then be in the situation where we'll have annual COVID boosters. OK, Fergus, many thanks once again. Fergus Walsh, our medical editor there, with the latest analysis. Uh, you can read uh, more about the changes announced today and the rules in place where you live in the UK. It's on our website, bbc.co.uk forward slash news. The other main story tonight, the prospect of a Russian military invasion of Ukraine has become even more realistic in the past few hours following a televised address by President Putin. He said he'd signed a decree recognising two breakaway regions of Ukraine and insisted that history was on his side because Ukraine, in his view, was not a true nation. The two regions in question are Donetsk and Luhansk, and diplomats warned that recognising these as independent states would give Russia the justification it wants to send in troops under the guise of protecting its own citizens. President Biden has agreed in principle to hold a summit with President Putin to discuss the crisis, but only if Russia gives up any plans to invade. Several major European airlines are suspending or reducing the number of flights to Ukraine because of security concerns. Our Moscow correspondent Steve Rosenberg has the latest for us. It was an astonishing piece of political theatre, played out on Russian TV. The protagonist, the president. Vladimir Putin alone, aloof, like a modern-day czar. The supporting cast, members of Russia's powerful Security Council. I will let you all speak, he said. Then we must decide what to do. And one by one, they spoke. All urging President Putin to defy Kiev and the West and officially recognize the pro-Russia rebel republics in eastern Ukraine. We must recognize these republics, the interior minister says, but within their earlier, larger boundaries. The president listened, but looked like a man who'd already made up his mind. Later, he addressed the nation. The essence of the aggressive nationalistic character of the regime that seized power in Kiev hasn't changed. I consider it necessary to immediately recognize the independence and sovereignty of the Donetsk and Lugansk People's Republics. Act 2, the signing ceremony. The leaders of the rebel republics were already in Moscow. They clearly knew what President Putin's decision would be. 
Earlier, this. Russian TV claimed Ukraine was shelling the rebel republics. Fake news, Kiev says. And Moscow inventing a pretext for military intervention. In recent days, thousands of civilians from the separatist republics have been evacuated to Russia. Moscow has been accused of using these people as political pawns. Many here are confused and frightened by what's been happening. The geopolitical consequences of Vladimir Putin's decision are not their priority. Tonight, in the rebel republics Russia has recognised, celebrations. But elsewhere in Ukraine and in the West, deep concern that Moscow may now move its forces openly into eastern Ukraine, that the Kremlin is set on a major escalation. Well, it was Moscow that basically created these rebel republics eight years ago after Russia first intervened militarily in eastern Ukraine. But Vladimir Putin's official recognition of their independence is a watershed moment. First of all, it basically kills off the internationally recognised peace process that Mr Putin himself recommitted himself to just a few days ago. It also raises fears of a major military escalation in eastern Ukraine. And from the decree he signed, it's clear that Vladimir Putin is already sending troops into those rebel republics, as the decree says, to keep the peace. Steve, many thanks again for the latest there in Moscow. Steve Rosenberg, let's get more reaction on this. Uh, in a moment, we'll talk to our North America editor, Sarah Smith, who's at the White House. First, let's go to the uh, Ukrainian capital, Kiev, and talk to our Eastern Europe correspondent, Sarah Rainsford. Sarah, given what uh, President Putin has announced uh, in these past few hours, where does that leave the government in Ukraine? Well, I'd say sombre, worried and angry is the mood here today. But things have moved so quickly that we haven't had a full official response just yet. In fact, uh, President Zelensky is holding an urgent meeting of his Security Council right now. We're expecting some kind of statement to come uh, in the early hours of uh, this morning. Uh, but we have heard from other politicians. They, of course, extremely uh, worried, uh, calling on uh, Ukraine's allies in the West to unite now to stop what they see uh, as an almost unstoppable Russian advance. Uh, some of and warning of the possibility even of a world war. So very strong language coming from politicians here in Ukraine. I mean, as you might expect, of course, Mr Zelensky has also been holding calls today, uh, this evening, with uh, political leaders across the West, with uh, Joe Biden, with uh, Boris Johnson, who call this a dark time in Ukraine, uh, the promise of sanctions from the UK to be announced tomorrow. But, you know, I think if this is Russia uh, testing the resolve of the West, this really is a key moment as far as Ukraine's concerned for how its allies respond to that. Sarah, many thanks. Sarah Rainsford there in Kiev. Let's go to uh, Washington and talk to Sarah Smith, our North America editor. Uh, the Biden administration, Sarah, has said several times that it was expecting Mr Putin to have made a decision. Uh, will tonight's events have changed the strategy in any way for them? Well, they, uh, President Biden himself said on Friday that he was now convinced that President Putin had made the decision to invade. What this move is being seen here, of course, is confirmation that their worst fears may be about to come true and that that evasion is going to go ahead. Uh, White House officials uh, responded immediately by saying that uh, they had anticipated a move like Russia and had measures ready. They've announced uh, economic sanctions on the uh, parts of Ukraine which uh, Vladimir Putin has now declared independent. And they're stressing that that is completely separate from a package of punishing sanctions that they have ready to go if Russia does further invade Ukraine. And those would be sanctions against Russia itself. President Biden has been working the phones tonight, speaking uh, not only to the Ukrainian president, but the president of France, the chancellor of Germany as well, as there is obvious deep concern here that this is a precursor for an invasion. Sarah, many thanks once again, Sarah Smith in Washington and Sarah Rainsford uh, for us in Kiev. Storm Franklin, the third named storm in the space of a week, has brought heavy rain and strong winds to many parts of the UK. Severe flooding in Northern Ireland, in Yorkshire and Greater Manchester have forced uh, people to leave their homes. There are more than 300 flood warnings uh, across England, Scotland and Wales. And a danger to life alert has been issued in Shropshire in the past few hours. Our correspondent Danny Savage has the latest. 
It's been a very wet weekend. Rivers across the UK have burst their banks and roads have been flooded. At Ironbridge in Shropshire, a severe flood warning is now in place for the River Severn. This is where the Environment Agency is most worried about. Our temporary barriers are in place and they will obviously do what they can to protect the community, but we are expecting potentially seeing uh, those barriers becoming overtopped and hence why the severe flood warning has been issued. Heavy rain across northern England meant these floodgates had to be opened in Manchester. It meant the local golf course disappeared underwater, but it saved homes from flooding. We didn't get a, a great deal of sleep because um, we kept on checking the, the app, monitoring the water levels. A um, little bit concerning, but yeah, it feels like we're over the worst of it now. A few miles away, a lorry caught fire after strong winds blew it into a bridge on the M6 near Wigan. The driver escaped unhurt, but there were long rush hour delays. A trip along the River Wharf in North Yorkshire revealed numerous floods. This is the high street in Tadcaster. The water was pretty deep. Properties in the Wharf Bank Terrace that are lived in, they've had to evacuate. A guy on the other side of the bridge climbed down a ladder to get out of his flat. It's very disappointing for the town. You know, nobody wants to run a business when this happens to it every few years, do they? Tadcaster Albion are now just one of many football clubs who won't be playing at home for a while. In the next village along, the bridge across the river was closed after showing signs that flood water was making it move. This is the River Wharf at Boston Spa and the main bridge linking the two halves of the community has had to be closed because a crack has appeared in it. And that means, for people living here, a seven-mile diversion to get from one side now to the other. In South Yorkshire, Rotherham Railway Station looked as though it was built for boats rather than trains. Storm Franklin rattled through Northern Ireland first with gusts of nearly 80 miles per hour. Wales was hit too. This was Clandinham in Powys, where homes were flooded. But tonight, these are anxious times for people living close to parts of the River Severn. They are hoping the many millions of pounds spent on flood defences will save their homes and businesses. Danny Savage, BBC News. We'll get uh, the latest now on the state of the River Severn. We'll go to Iron Bridge and our correspondent Andrew Plant is there. What's the latest on the state of the river? Yeah, Hugh, you can see those temporary flood barriers that have gone up behind us there. They go up a couple of times a year, but this time does feel different because everybody living behind those barriers has been advised to leave their homes. And in fact, people living either side have been told it might be a good idea to have a bag packed and ready to go in case they need to leave in a hurry. And it is, of course, the swollen river levels that are the problem. Now, we were upriver earlier today and there the Severn has already burst its banks and surrounded some homes too. And there is this delay in effect. All the extra water we're seeing here essentially fell over the Welsh Hills miles away over the weekend and takes 48 hours or so to come downstream and that's really the problem because that means these levels are still rising. In fact we're told they might not peak until this time tomorrow so for everybody here and thousands more living alongside the River Severn there is still a very nervous night and day still ahead. Hugh. Andrew many thanks once again for the latest there and in Ironbridge. Andrew Plant. Musicians, actors and members of the royal family have led tributes to the musician and entrepreneur Jamal Edwards, who's died suddenly at the age of 31. Jamal was credited with helping to launch a clutch of music careers, including those of Ed Sheeran and Dave. He's also an ambassador for the Prince's Trust charity. Our music correspondent, Mark Savage, considers Jamal's remarkable legacy. Ah, uh -uh. Smokey Boss TV. Boss TV. We got Smokey Boss. We got. This is how Jamal Edwards started a media empire. A grainy clip filmed on a £20 mobile phone in the middle of a school trip. He created the SBTV channel on YouTube in 2006, frustrated that he couldn't find the music that he loved online. Everyone in my area was was a was an MC, mm. um, and I remember I was just sitting there and I was thinking, why can't I find these online? And if they were online, it was just bad quality versions. So I thought, all right, yeah. cool, I'm gonna try and film the people that are in my area 
and upload it to YouTube. Before long, SBTV had become the go-to place for British rap. It gave early exposure to artists like Stormzy, Dave and Ed Sheeran. The channel played a key role in making grime go mainstream and earned Jamal Edwards an MBE at the age of 24. He put his success to good use, funding youth groups for underprivileged children and raising awareness of mental health. Musicians and DJs have remembered him as an inspiration. If I had one word to describe Jamal, be selfless. With Jamal, I never had to question what he was after or, or his intentions, because I know he just wanted everyone to be great. I don't know anybody that has a bad word to say about Jamal. Um, and I'm just really glad he got his flowers when he was alive because one thing he can know, rest assured, that he was a legend and we all knew that and, and his legacy really will live on. In Acton, where he was raised, fans and friends have been leaving flowers and messages of tribute. He was the hero of Acton. He was the guy who showed you could make it out without being a drug dealer, without getting involved in crime and everything. Jamal was the guy that showed kids from low-income households that you are not limited to what your grades might tell you. My abiding memory of him would be his vision. What he, what, how, how, uh, how he looked ahead and how he knew what to do. Jamal's impact on music cannot be overestimated. And as mourners held a vigil in Acton tonight, they'll have remembered his own words. The goal isn't to live forever. The goal is to create something that will. Some of the many tributes paid today to Jamal Edwards, the pioneering musician and entrepreneur who's died suddenly at the age of 31. That's it from us now on BBC One. It's time for the news where you are. Have a good night.